It is great to see everyone this morning. It's good to have our visitors with us today. <clears throat> I do want to remind everybody that if you can, certainly need to encourage and support our brethren at Riverside as they begin their meeting today. That is where HD is at this morning. He's preaching over there. Uh, we have to understand if we don't support their meetings, they probably won't support ours. So we need to be supporting our good, sound brethren in their efforts. As we continue our series on the home and the family, I do want to talk this morning about the value of a good home. We've often heard the expression, as goes the home, so also goes the nation. And the reason is because the home is the backbone. It is the support of any society. And when it falls, then the nation itself is also going to crumble. And I think the founders of our nation actually realized this and they strove to build their homes upon godly principles. But now today we see a different story. We see people who are trying to minimize the Bible and say it's nothing more than just a good book. Nothing more inspired than the writings of Shakespeare. The home was built by God and therefore it is to his word that we have to go to find out how to build our homes in a proper manner. <clears throat> So if you throw away the Bible, you're going to minimize the home. Now history has clearly pointed to the fact that whenever a society or a nation turns from God and from his word, then chaos and rampant sin are going to be the result. Rome's downfall was because they had turned away from God and they had a great love for wealth and for sexual perversions. Germany with Hitler couldn't stand because they built their nation upon greed and world dominance. Friends, we're starting to see some of those same seeds in our nation today. And if we don't turn from that and change our ways and turn back to God and to his word like we should, we're going to see our nation crumble also. I want you to notice some of the sins that this country is involved in and the effects that it is having on our people, our children our homes and our families. And this is what happens when men try to direct their own steps. Now, where I got the idea for this lesson is I was reading the newspaper one day and I found an article in there that they were talking about the commonalities that inmates in our prisons have with one another and what actually landed them in prison. And there are four things that it, it is actually talked about that's going to be the four main points of my lesson. But they talked about child abuse in the home, they talked about divorce, welfare, and drug and alcohol abuse. So let's begin with the child abuse in the homes. <clears throat> now, of course, this becomes very common when families do not heed God's instructions. And God has given us the instruction for the home. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through chapter 6, verse 4, Paul gives some things concerning each member of the household. And in verses 22 through 24, he says, Wives are to submit to their own husbands. And that word submit literally means to give up one's own right or will. Now, that's not a bad thing. Christ himself was submissive to the Father, and he is our perfect example in all things. Back in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, Paul mentions something about this. He says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus thought more of others than himself. And we too are to esteem others better than ourselves. That's a type of submission. So we're all to have this submissive nature about ourselves. Now the reason for the wife's submission is that the husband is the head of the wife. Just like the church is to submit to her head, Jesus Christ, the wife is to submit to her head, the husband. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, we have two reasons that are given for her submission. Adam was first formed, and then the woman, and Eve was in the transgression. She was the one who was deceived. 
Now, this submission is to be done out of love and not to be done out of fear. Marriage is not a dictatorship. She is not in a submissive position because she's in an inferior position. But they are both equals, both working for the same place, going to the same goal. And we just have different roles within the family. Not everyone can be the head of the family. Somebody has to take that role. And God gave it to the man. And she is to submit out of love to her husband and also to submit out of love to her God. In verses 25 through 33, Paul says, Husbands are to love their wives. How much are they to love their wives? Well, he says in verse 25, As much as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In verse 28, He's to love his wife as much as his own body. And then verse 33, as much as he loves himself. Now, in showing this love, even husbands are, in a sense, to submit to their own wives. As we see in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5, we are to submit ourselves to one another. So we are to submit both ways. As husbands, we, are need, we need to submit to our wives' needs. Now, Husbands, I'm going to give you this, not necessarily to their wants or their desires, but to their needs, we are to submit these things. So submission does work both ways. And remember this, if you don't work together in the family unit, you're not going to stay together. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 of the book of Ephesians, Paul says, Children are to obey their parents in the Lord. They are to follow their parents as they teach them and guide them according to God's precepts. But we do always have to remember Acts chapter 5, verse 29, it is better to obey God than man. In other words, if parents teach their children to do something that is contrary to God's law or his commands or his will, they are to obey God rather than their parents. In verse 4 of chapter 6, fathers are not to provoke their children to wrath. There is a two-way relationship between parents and children. And a child can be provoked to wrath and rebellion. So we need to take great care in how we raise our children. A child can be provoked. And you know, we owe a lot of our moralities to our parents. And we owe that same thing to our children. Solomon said in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. A child who is raised with no discipline will more than likely not heed discipline when they grow older. Now one thing I want to make clear, contrary to what the, the world teaches, discipline is not abuse. The Bible condemns abuse, but we are to discipline our children. A child that is raised with no love will more than likely not love later. A child that is abused will often be the type that will abuse later. And in the same manner, a child who is taught the truth, they'll never forget that truth. And it's not saying that they'll never sin or fall away or stray, because they are free moral agents. Really, I think that's what this passage is teaching, is that that teaching will always be with them. I, have, I raised two daughters, and they were rebellious at times, but they knew that when they were doing that which was wrong, they knew it was wrong because they'd been taught right. They still did it. That teaching stuck with them, but they're still free moral agents. Now, abuse in a child's life will affect that child for the rest of their lives, whether we're talking about mental abuse or physical abuse. And this should be very evident by the statistics that have been provided for us by various studies. Now, this newspaper article that I had picked up one time, it spoke on the common things that characterize many of the inmates in our prison system today. And here is one of the things that that research revealed. And I quote, it said almost half the female inmates and 13% of jailed men have been abused sexually or physically at least once in their lives. More than a quarter of the women, 27%, and 3% of men said the abuse included rape. It says the tragedy is that people who have been victimized often become victimizers themselves. And one expert in the article said, 
the study probably understates the frequency the inmates have been abused. So he thinks that the percentages are actually higher. If families would just exhibit the love for one another that the Bible tells us that we are to have for one another, then all the problems that we are facing today in the family would virtually be eliminated. But we have to follow what God says. God made the home, and he knows what he's talking about. But here's something else that this article brought out was concerning divorce in the home. Now, a family unit is to be one in aim, in purpose, and design. The family it was never intended to function divided from one another. They are to be united. In fact, we go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. There it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh, united together. It's restated again there in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. So God really knows what he's talking about, and he means what he says. But you know, divorce was never in God's plan, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Now, Malachi 2, verse 16 says, For the Lord, the God of Israel, he saith that he hateth putting away. He hates divorce. Now, of course, God realizes that there are some things that are out of our control, so he has allowed one exception to the rule for divorce. One exception to divorce for divorce and only one exception. Let's take our Bibles and go to Malachi, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I think this is something that you need to see for yourself. I know most of you already know where, where I'm going. But if you haven't seen this, you need to read this for yourself from the Bible. Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at verses 31 and 32. Here Jesus is giving an answer to Moses' decree in the law concerning divorce. And Jesus said, It hath been said, now he's talking about what has been said in the old law. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let, her, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But... Now he's going to contrast what was said and now what he is now teaching. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. And that word committeth in the Greek is a present tense verb meaning a continuous action. If a person divorces their spouse for some other reason than fornication and they marry someone else, as long as they are in that relationship, they will continue to commit adultery. And adultery is a work of the flesh that will keep us out of heaven. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. This is kind of the parallel verse of Matthew 5. But Jesus is now talking to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 19. Look at verses 8 and 9. He says, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you or allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. There's your present tense verb again. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So the sad thing is, is when a person who is wrongfully divorced, goes out and remarries, now you've got two more people committing adultery. It's not just the one who's been divorced, but both of them now. So if you find yourself in an unscriptural marriage, if you were divorced for some other reason than fornication and you have remarried, you are wrong in God's eyes. And baptism is not going to wash that sin away as long as you remain in that relationship. Repentance always has to precede baptism. And so you have to dissolve that sinful union before you can make yourself right with God. Now the scriptures are plain, and there are really no other excuses. Now there are instances, as in severe abuse or threat to life or children, that God does not demand the couple to stay together. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11, Paul said this, Let not the wife depart from her husband. Now that depart is not divorce. That's just a separation. 
He says, let not the wife depart from her husband, but and if she depart, if she separates, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. This is not allowing remarriage here. This is dealing with a separation if something is involved that the two need to separate for some reason. They both have to remain unmarried, but the spouse is not under obligation to remain with this other person if her life is in jeopardy or if her health is in jeopardy. Paul says you separate for a time for prayer and fasting, and then you come back together. But if you cannot come back together because the situation has not been resolved, you can't marry someone else. But if you can, come back together so that you will not be tempted in your incontinency. Neglecting these goals in marriage has caused a lot of devastation among the families of America today. And the children are always the ones who seem to have to suffer. They're the ones who seem to have to pay the consequences. So remember, when we divorce, we're not affecting just ourselves. We're affecting other people too. Here's what the newspaper article said concerning inmates and divorce. It said, large numbers of the inmates grew up in single-parent homes and were children of dissolute parents. About half the nation's inmates grew up in single-parent homes and 12% had lived in households without either parent. It's very obvious, divorce is not the answer for our family problems. In fact, all it does is it just causes more problems. The majority of our inmates in our prisons have been affected by divorce. This article also speaks about welfare in the homes. Now, welfare is not just destroying our nation, but it's also destroying our homes. This disposition only teaches a person that someone else owes you a living. Now, Paul doesn't support that. In fact, he tells us there in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, then neither should he eat. The welfare system today says, you don't have to work, we'll feed you. Paul says, if you don't work, you don't need to eat. Welfare today is actually a selfish attitude. It says society owes me everything and I don't owe society a thing. We know that too much idle time on a person's hands only spells trouble. You've heard the old saying, idle hands is the devil's workshop. And it's true with everyone. Your idle hours are the ones that are going to get you in more trouble than any other time. If we kept busy, we wouldn't have time to gossip about other people. We wouldn't have time to get involved in drugs and alcohol. We wouldn't have time to be looking for trouble. The article said this about uh, welfare. It said large numbers of the inmates spent at least part of their childhood in homes on welfare or in public housing. More than a third, 36%, said they were unemployed before their most recent arrest. Too much time on their hands. Close to 39% spent some part of their childhood in households that had received welfare or public housing assistance. At the time of their arrest, one in five inmates, that's 20%, was receiving government assistance. 14% on welfare, 7% on social security or supplemental security income, and 3% on unemployment, workers, or veterans compensation. We are to help people who are in need, but we're not to help the selfish wanters. Giveaway programs like our welfare system, giving things to people who don't really need it, we're only feeding a problem. Welfare only has its place in society when it is handled right. Otherwise, it tends to feed and to magnify the dredge of society. One other thing that this article mentioned was drugs and alcohol in the home. Now, the use of illegal drugs and alcohol is a work of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, described as drunkenness. And it is a sin, and it will keep a person out of heaven. In the year 2015, and this is the latest year I could find statistics on, but there's an alarming number here. 86.4% of all Americans ages 18 years and up, 209 million people 
drank alcohol or used drugs in 2015, 86.4% of all Americans. And though the majority of the people of America abuse these things, it does not mean that they are not severely condemned in God's holy word. We are not to follow a multitude to do evil, Exodus 23, verse 2. In fact, I don't know if I've ever really heard a wife say, you know, I think things would have been a lot better in our homes if my husband would have spent a little more time in the bar. I don't think I've ever heard a woman say that before. Drinking and drugs destroy you externally, internally, and eternally. Now, everyone can relate their own experiences and their heartaches from drugs and drinking, whether we're talking social or otherwise, with their parents, their children, their husbands, or their wives. The newspaper article said this about the relation of inmates and alcohol and drug abuse. It said nearly one-third of the inmates said their parents or guardians abused alcohol and drugs. More than half of the convicted jail inmates reported having used illegal drugs in the month before their crimes. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Proverbs chapter, let's go, to, go ahead and go to chapter 23. Proverbs 23. But you know, inspiration says a lot about alcohol abuse. In chapter 20, verse 1, it makes it very clear, wine is a mocker. Wine deceives you makes fun of you but notice what solomon said in proverbs 23 look at verses 29 through 33. he said who hath woe who hath sorrow who hath contentions who hath babbling who hath wounds without cause who hath redness of eyes and he gives the answer they that tarry long at the wine they that go to seek mixed wine and here's his instructions. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. He didn't say don't use it. He says don't even look at it. And here's the reason. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thy heart shall utter perverse things. You know, there is a common story that comes out of the dance halls and bars is that men who go in there and drink usually have wandering eyes and their eyes behold strange women and they become tempted and they do things that they should not. You see, alcohol pushes a person to do things that they know they shouldn't do and they know that it's wrong. Alcohol and drugs bring out the stupidity in people. Don't be stupid and use these things. You know, a child's early life largely determines their future. What is learned in the home is directly related to what they will actually become as adults. Children need to be taught the Bible in the home so they can have a good, solid, solid foundation upon which they can stand on later in life. Society would be much, much improved if we would just go back to the Bible and do things the Bible way. You know, nations are made up of families, and when the families fall, so will the nation. So let's fix the families. Now, for success, every family must have Christ in the home. And to have Christ in our homes, his word has to be our guide. His authority has to be our rule. His example is to be our strength. His church is to be our life and our devotion to him and our advantage over the world. God's principles have to be respected. And it all has to really begin with us. Are you tired of problems in your life? Then bring Christ to your, your broken life. He is there to help. Remember that great invitation that Jesus made there in Matthew chapter 11? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. All it takes for you is just take a step. Of course, that step begins right here. You have to determine in your mind that you want to, to mend your broken life. But don't try to do it alone. 
come to Jesus. He has offered to help us, to be our strength and our stay and our bulwark of the faith. If there's something that you need, if we can help you with, if you're not a child of God, won't you become one and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ today? Believing in him as the promised Messiah, the Son of God who he claimed to be, confessing that faith before men, repenting of your sins and being baptized for the remission of your sins, and then living faithful from then on. And if you haven't been living faithful as a Christian, you can bring your broken life to Jesus still. He's still there waiting for you when you stray away. If there's anything that we can help you with, whatever it may be, maybe you need the prayers of this congregation. If you have a need, once you make it known, while together we stand and sing.